Welcome everyone to this symposium on intellectual property in the biosciences. Uh, my name is Greg Raddick. I'm based here at Leeds. And it's my uh, great privilege uh, to launch uh, this symposium with a few words of introduction. And I want to do that, and I hope I don't lower the tone too much uh, right at the start, with a couple of pieces of pub trivia, uh, in one case quite literally, about Leeds and why Leeds is actually a fitting place uh, for a meeting like this. <clears throat> First of all, uh, it's not widely known uh, about Leeds that it's actually the home of the first biotech consultancy in the world, very probably, certainly in the UK. Uh, it was established on Queen Square in Leeds in 1920. The Bureau of Biotechnology. The biotechnology in question was microbiology, applied microbiology. This was a firm which serviced, in the first instance, the brewing industry. These were a group of chemists who had a missionary zeal for training up in the biological sciences in order to provide uh, better advice to the brewing industry. And in fact, they founded a bulletin, uh, published a bulletin of the Bureau of Biotechnology as a venue for their research. That's not widely known. I learned that from Robert Budd uh, in uh, one of his fabulous books a few years ago. This is better known, but can be better known still. In the 1920s and 1930s, uh, Leeds was the center of what William Astbury, the textile physicist here at Leeds, was among the first to call molecular biology. That is almost Astbury's coinage. Astbury arrived uh, in the late 1920s uh, with funding from the textile workers of Leeds on the view that by funding fundamental research into fibers, beginning of course with wool and the proteins constituting uh, fibers, something commercially valuable might come of it. That's what brought Asprey to Leeds. And Asprey began a program using X-ray crystallography to investigate the molecular structure of biological fibers with great success, initially with keratin, the uh, major protein in wool. But the program vastly expanded. And around about 1937, a graduate student of his, you see it pictured, uh, pictured here with her, Florence Bell, <clears throat> uh, they conducted the first investigations into the molecular structure of DNA. And so it was here at Leeds, in Asprey's lab, that the first X-ray diffraction photograph of DNA was taken. And right now you can see in the Brotherton Library, in the foyer, uh, some of this work, including uh, the camera, uh, one of the cameras from those investigations. That's what X-ray apparatus looked like. That's what molecular biology looked like around 1937, uh, a DIY business. Now, uh, why do I mention all of this besides uh, outsized pride in my adopted hometown, uh, of which I have a lot? I mention these uh, facts, these little bits of pub trivia, because to my mind, they nicely resonate uh, with the themes of this meeting. And there are going to be any number of them. Uh, but I'm going to mention uh, three in particular that stand out to me. And, and I'd like to hope that uh, these might be good for you to think with as you listen to the presentations uh, in the course of the day. First of all, uh, I think we learn from these episodes, the Bureau of Biotechnology in the 20s, Asprey in the 30s, that the biological sciences have never been pure. Uh, here I deliberately refer to a, a new book by one of the great gurus in our field, the history of science, Steve Shapin. Never Pure is the uh, title of a new collection of his. Right from the start, well before the present, one finds modern biological sciences in the thick of commercially lively aspirations. It's very tempting, especially if your scientific education happened at some point during the Cold War, to think that there is some immemorially enduring paradise in which biologists were free from sullying connections with the commercial world and they could just get on with the business of finding out what was true. They were uncompromised. They were uncompromised commercially. They were uncompromised ethically. Something we're increasingly uh, seeing in historical writing about the biological sciences is a notion that that Cold War period is the anomaly. 
And when we think our way back into the 20s and 30s, we're in some ways seeing a kind of a mirror uh, of where we are now. So that's a, the first thing uh, to, uh, to my mind that uh, might come up in, in the course of the meeting. The second theme is a relationship between innovations in technology when it comes to the biological sciences and innovations in what you might think of as disciplinary location. Think about the two examples I just gave you. The Leeds Bureau of Biotechnology was staffed by chemists. Chemists who, however, saw themselves as pioneering a path to biology. They were, they, they were quite evangelical about the need to get serious about biology, and how much better the microbiology of the past would have been if those chemists had really known their biology. With Asbury, uh, Asbury was a physicist trained by Bragg at the Royal Institution. When he coined, or, or it borrowed, not entirely clear, the phrase molecular biology, it rang strange. Molecular biology was deliberately awkward as a coinage. The idea of using methods from physics to investigate biological materials. We've lost that sense of unfamiliarity. Uh, but Asprey saw himself as, as a straddler, as a pioneer across disciplinary bounds. And again, I think we're going to see this come up throughout the day, the ways in which biological innovation now is, in sometimes awkward ways, sometimes exciting ways, uh, spanning disciplinary boundaries, or at least representing itself as doing so. something different. Finally, uh, I hope that at least one of the pieces of information I gave you was surprising. And to my mind, this is one of the values of going for wider perspectives on the present, is that you get surprised. Uh, and from surprise can come critical perspective, which is otherwise hard to engineer off your own bat. Uh, I'm a historian of science, so the perspective I've provided you with is historical. There's going to be more of that in the course of the meeting, but not just that. We're going to hear from sociologists, from lawyers, from legal scholars, from geographers, uh, from science policy experts, some studying it, some actually putting it into action. So this is, I think, a very unusual opportunity for all of us to see quite what one gets when you bring a wide variety of perspectives to bear on a, ser a set of issues which uh, quite a lot of people are perplexed by, anxious about, excited about, uh, according to taste. So that's where uh, we're going. I should say just a few words about the institutional uh, background for the meeting. Uh, we uh, are the White Rose IP Bio Project. Uh, the White Rose is a consortium of three universities here in the north of England, Leeds, uh, Sheffield, and York. Uh, and in their wisdom, they've tried to let a little bit of money available from time to time to help colleagues across these institutions who share interests come together uh, with others from around the world who share their interests uh, to advance knowledge. And uh, it's courtesy of the White Rose that we have the funding for this event. Uh, so I'd like to, like to thank them for that. But there is a further background. Uh, we got the uh, grant for this project uh, in 2009. The idea for applying for the grant came uh, the year uh, previously when Leeds, and specifically myself and Barris Charnley, uh, who's the major organizer of the meeting today, were deputized uh, at a meeting in Berlin uh, on living properties uh, to set up an IP bio network. Uh, so we did that in the first instance with a website, but also with the, mission, with the idea that there should one day be a meeting, a first meeting, and this is that meeting. Finally, I should mention that uh, there are links as well with the other conference happening in this building, co-located, as I've uh, learned to call it, uh, which is a, a, a larger conference on the history of intellectual property and the techno-sciences in Britain in the decades around 1900. It was our connection with that which led Barris to the Berlin meeting, and so it goes. So that's a little bit of the institutional background. Finally, about the, the format. Uh, today you're going to hear uh, eight talks over the course of the day. Each talk is going to go for about 25 minutes, leaving roughly 15 to 20 minutes for discussion. At the end of the day, there'll be uh, a brief, but no doubt lively, summing up session uh, in which I've asked a number of members of the IP Bio Project team to each give in five minutes, they're uh, scintillating summings up uh, of this very heterogeneous day. So that's worth looking forward to. It's a kind of academic high-wire walking. At least that's how I think of it. 
Tomorrow there will be a summer school in the morning. Uh, graduate students have submitted papers uh, in this area and uh, there will be a, a, a kind of a workshop on that and that will end uh, with a, a planning session for those who might want to take uh, this all forward. So if you don't know about the summer school and you're interested in attending, come see me later. Uh, but otherwise, I'll close off here and without further ado, introduce our first speaker.